Hello, everybody. I think this might be my chance to speak with you. I'm trying to share my screen, and I see only myself in your um, public, but it's really nice to be here. That's great. Um, I hope you can see my screen. I can't see you, and um, it's really an honor to be here, uh, and I'm really sorry I can't be with you in person. Um, I'm going to apologize. I know you had a fire alarm today. Um, I'm in the middle of a storm, um, a very windy day in Italy. Um, and I'm, I'm really grateful to be here today to talk to you about um, something which is quite important to me, which is making conservation a bit more sustainable. And uh, this is both from education and from a um, practical point of view. And, and today I'm talking to you uh, from my home, but I am um, wanted to tell you a little bit about where I work. Uh, which has actually changed since I last came uh, to Riga. Um, in fact, I remember really fondly the last Congress, uh, which I attended um, in 2019, uh, when my children were little, and we had this very amazing uh, uh, visit to um, Rendala uh, Castle and wonderful time together in Riga. Um, and when I came last to Riga, I spoke about conservation and science and education and research, and I was speaking a little bit from the perspective of a senior lecturer at the University of Göteborg in Sweden. And uh, today, my, my, my circumstances have changed a bit, um, and I'm no longer working in Sweden, but working in the UK. But when I spoke last, I, I mentioned the, the really important triad that I'm sure you have been talking about today and which is going to be reflected in this Congress of conservation of science and art history, where we are really working very closely together across disciplines and across fields. And if we think about what we need in the profession and what we need as conservators, we know we need to have very good skills with our hands, um, but we also need to have very practical and applied knowledge. Um, we are not uh, craftspeople. We are not um, working on the same problems every day. And I was looking at this, the program you have in front of you uh, for this week, and I see you have a very, very wide range of different conservation problems, from preventive conservation storage to the treatment of contemporary objects, ancient metals, and stone, and so on. And this requires that we have a very strong ethical um, framework as well as a critical mindset, um, because we don't, we are not faced with clinical situations um, in, in hospitals where we are statistics. Instead, we are looking at objects which have their own unique history, unique context, and, and possibly quite variable conservation histories. And of course, I am also coming from the point of view of uh, the vice president of the IIC, in, um, which is the International Institute for the Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works. And I, I realized that um, it is, you, you, you represent a very important network of conservators um, in the Nordic region and your publications and the work that has been, that has contributed to this Congress will be a very important record as are the Congresses by ICOM CC, whether that is in the triennial meeting or instead specific working groups. And I come back to this again and again, that the, there are very few specific conservation publications. Um, some of them are only available in the gray literature, things that we don't find very easily. But for me and for my students, increasingly, we make use of the open access publications, free publications that we might find online on, in studies in conservation, within ICOMCC and of course at the Getty Conservation Institute, which are, are really the references for, for the field. And when we think about our, the guidelines of a profession, it's sometimes a little bit scary. And I think I mentioned this last time we met, the, the, all the things that a conservator and you and I are supposed to be able to do. Um, now I'm not going to read this slide, um, but I will just say that we have so many different skills that we need to be able to draw from, whether that is regarding assessment, um, which is a huge component of our work, to decide if, a con if conservation is necessary or not, to decide how 
we will proceed uh, to decide whether or not we can, um, there are alternatives to doing a treatment. Um, of course, we also must be able to actually do the treatment, um, whether that is cleaning or fixing or repainting or retouching or varnishing or consolidating. And we also are, of course, expected to collaborate with each other, with colleagues in different countries, different institutions. And, and finally, the reason I'm here and the reason you are together is you care about um, development of the field. You want to be able to contribute to uh, new conservation treatments and also participating and sharing our work, which is sometimes some of the hardest work. Uh, it's uh, to, to come and speak in public, to present your work as a young uh, scholar, young conservator, but it's very important because you are sharing your ideas with one another and this is the way we will advance the field. Now, I have a personal story, which I mentioned earlier. Um, I moved in 2020 from Sweden to London. I got a job at the University of London at the Portal Institute of Art. And I didn't expect um, that I would be leaving this wonderful Nordic country for the dark uh, London, where the first sign I saw was for the cigarettes or the nicotine uh, pouches from Sweden in London. And of course, this was in the middle of the pandemic. And one of the things that I we learned together in the pandemic was that it is possible to meet online. It's not so fun, um, but it's possible. And it's possible also to, uh, to do a lot of learning and teaching online. But I was very lucky that at the institute where I went, um, which is now my home, at the Courtauld Institute of Arts, we were able to keep our laboratories open throughout the pandemic, although we had to teach in a different way. And one of the challenges I had when I arrived in London was to reform or to examine the uh, programs that we taught at the Courtauld um, because we needed to shift from a diploma um, degree to a master's degree. Now, Coming back to the title of my talk, Making Conservation uh, More Sustainable from Education to Practice, I'm gonna to focus today on aspects of our teaching and aspects of our practice, which I think can be examined in a different way, thinking about how we, how we teach, um, what we teach, what we need to learn, and what are the challenges that we have in education. Now, at the Courtauld Institute of Arts, which is my perspective um, today, we have four different programs in conservation. Two of them are three-year programs and two of them are one-year programs. The two programs which are three years are master's degree programs, which is a little bit different, I think, from the programs that we have in other areas of Europe, where master's might be two years um, after a bachelor's degree. In the UK, in general, conservation training is mostly uh, postgraduate training. There are some programs in the UK which are undergraduate training, but they are they tend to be um, focused on specific types of materials or um, but they are not um, they don't necessarily produce conservators of fine art. Um, so uh, if the decorative arts and um, other materials you may have the opportunity in the UK to study at the undergraduate level. But most of the students who have trained, to be painting conservators and wall painting conservators in the UK have done so at the postgraduate level. And that's maybe an important thing to recognize from the beginning. Now, there are general challenges that we all face when teaching conservation. And the first, which I remind my director and I remind myself, is that it's very expensive to teach conservation. It's very expensive to study conservation. Um, it's a little bit like medicine which requires a very large number of hours um, actually doing practical work. And this is a problem which is facing all conservation programs around the world. And in the UK, we are um, not like, unlike anywhere else, conservation programs have closed because they are too expensive to run. And um, I am lucky at the Courtauld because conservation is one of the key components of the Institute but it is still very expensive to run this program compared, for example, to teaching theoretical um, programs. Um, so this is something we all recognize and it's a challenge that we face internationally. This is in part because we have a lot of laboratories 
we actually have spent a lot of time doing work in spaces which might be big, huge, um, where we have climate control or not. And we also have a lot of supervision. We also have teaching of science and um, theor theory combined with practice, which are two different aspects of applied conservation. Sustainability has come up often. Um, it came up when I was teaching in Sweden. It is, it is one of the aspects that we are all focusing on, the sustainability goals. But what exactly does that mean for us? Um, there are various ways we can define sustainability, and this makes conservation quite exciting, but also quite challenging. And I'll talk about this a little bit later. We also have a vast range of materials. If I think about painting conservation alone, we have hundreds of different inorganic orga and organic materials, ranging from pigments to binding media, to textiles, to adhesives, to varnishes, to modern materials, nanomaterials, gels, etc. All of which we need to understand and we use. And maybe one of the problems we have is we have too much information. How can I teach so many things in three years? And the answer, of course, is I cannot. And one of the challenges that we all face as conservators is that we must be selective about what we need to know and we need to continue learning. Um, I didn't learn about gels when I was studying conservation because gels were not as common in 2000 as they are now. And my students know much more than I did when I was a student. But the students that we have today are also different from the students that I was and that you were. Uh, I relied heavily on books and published articles and libraries where I would spend time finding references in books and in, um, in publications. And today we have shifted to online uh, knowledge where we can find things very quickly, but it is very frustrating to me sometimes when my students um, find things online, but they haven't looked at the reference books that I would think are so important. Now at the Courtauld, coming back to my specific case, how do we teach conservation? Well, we have a strong consolidated program, which has been running for the last um, almost 40 years, um, which combines theory and practice. Um, we expect students who come to the Courtauld to have knowledge already of science. Um, and this is a change in the program. We used to teach science as part of the core curriculum, basic chemistry, basic physics, but it's not possible to do this any longer because um, we have a master's program. And this means that we are able to instead request that students learn certain things before they come. Art history and preventive conservation are fundamental aspects of the teaching that we do at the Cortal. We are the, one of the most, um, the largest institutes for art history in the UK. And the, um, therefore art history forms a major component of learning. And preventive conservation is also a strength of, of both programs because we recognize how important it is that students who finish the practical training are able to make recommendations regarding preventive measures as well as practical treatment. Now, studio and, fun and field work are absolutely core components of our program as they are, I'm sure, of the programs where you teach and you studied. But why is this? This is because we want our students to be able to make decisions, to be able to defend decisions, and to be able to learn on their own as much as possible because we will not be there as, tutor, as teachers, as supervisors beyond the duration of the training. And the other aspect of all master's programs around the world is that there is a research component where students must spend time doing a research project, um, which is different from a bachelor's degree where students may not have time to do this and they don't have the skills to develop independent research. Now, the teaching at the Courtauld, as I mentioned earlier, is a postgraduate degree. It's a master's degree, like a master's degree you might find at the University of Amsterdam, for example. Supervision and small group teaching are quite common in conservation, but this is one of the reasons that it becomes so expensive. Now, just so I don't forget to mention, 
the Corto does not teach all aspects of conservation. We focus only on the conservation of easel paintings and wall paintings. And that is, as I told you earlier, a little bit my bias. So I am not talking about the teaching of architectural conservation or stone conservation, which requires um, specialization in different institutions. Now, what are some of the specific challenges that I face teaching conservation to students? I wanted to focus on two aspects, one of which was the teaching of science and how we integrate scientific teaching um, into our laboratories. And the other is about sustainability and how we try to build sustainability into the practice of conservation itself. And I'm going to talk about wall painting conservation in that context. Now, the first aspect relates to teaching and understanding scientific concepts. Now, we know that there are really lots of concepts in science which are difficult to understand. And there's an article which was presented at Copenhagen, um, the ICOMC 2017, so it's almost uh, seven years ago, but it focuses on aspects which are absolutely still relevant. Looking at how concepts that are taught at school or taught at the university really change the way we understand the, the world in which we live and how these concepts relate to conservation. And the question that colleagues asked was, what are the most difficult concepts for students to, to learn? And what are the most difficult things for me to teach? And one of the concepts which was hardest for people and also for conservators when they're young is solubility. And solubility might be a concept which I struggle to teach, um, even though I studied chemistry many years ago and I have good knowledge of intermolecular forces. So we know about solubility of varnishes and we often use this type of chart to understand what solvents we can choose. Now we know that this is an approximation and this, this chart that is the, the T's chart um, was developed based on looking at different forces inside of solvents, whether they are dispersion forces, dipole, dipole forces, and hydrogen bonding. These are three different concepts which we can look at, look about, look, we can look into online and read about them. We can try to understand them. But you see on this diagram that there are areas of different solvents. You probably all know about the T's chart. Now, we know that the hydrogen bonding is regarded as one of the most essential aspects of the solubility of, all of organic materials when they age. But we also know that it's not very straightforward to use this chart. There are some problems with this chart. Um, in other words, this is theory, but practice may not be the same. And so we need to think of how we will apply this knowledge when we are working, uh, for example, in paintings conservation. And in fact, our colleagues in Canada recognize that solubility is very difficult to visualize and to explain. And, and the other aspect is that students um, learn about the T's chart, but they are not always confident in using them. And we need to know when we can use them and when we can't use them. And so this can create a situation where students decide not to try to understand solubility. And that's really, really, that's really a problem. Now, the other thing that is useful to think about is that the problems that are facing conservators, you and me, are not only a problem for us. Solubility is a difficult task to, to teach to everybody. And we realize that students at all levels and teachers at all levels are challenged by solubility teaching. In fact, solubility is essential in so many different areas of chemistry, paint chemistry and uh, biomedical research, analysis, organic chem chemistry, and also for us. And it's relevant for so many different areas of practice, whether that's salt extraction, cleaning organic materials, application of adhesives, and so on and so forth. So understanding solubility might seem to be essential for our work, but where is it that, what, is that, what are the challenges specifically? 
Now, one of the reasons solubility is so hard is that it is related to different factors, one of which is mo the molecules that we are working with. Are they organic molecules? Is it a water molecule? Is it a polar solvent, nonpolar solvent, and so on and so forth? And what are the charges of the ions that we are looking at? Are they positive charged, negative charged? Are they very ionic, covalent, and so on and so forth? And how does thermodynamics, which is something which uh, we learn at the theoretical level, how does this impact the, con the solubility of materials? Now, of course, in theory, we can draw diagrams as to how solvents will and, and ions will change as we separate them, as we dissolve them, as we um, uh, allow them to mix, and so on and so forth. But these concepts are very difficult to relate specifically to removal of varnish, for example, or the solubility of salts in the wall paintings. Now, remember that we are not alone in studying this problem. In fact, it's not surprising that students have difficulty understanding um, ionic behavior because this model of ions and particles took hundreds of years for scientists to understand. It's not something that, uh, that is logical, that, that, uh, that molecules will behave as ions in some cases, and in other cases, they don't. And so actually, our understanding of matter has taken hundreds of years of science to achieve. And therefore, it's not, it's not so surprising that students don't understand um, how, how to relate ions and molecules to solubility. And in fact, we know from research in teaching that um, understanding molecular interactions is really hard. And the other thing which is difficult is that it's sometimes um, some of the explanations we have in textbooks are major oversimplifications. For example, we often talk about, well, like dissolves like. This is something we sometimes say in English. And this is a little bit wrong um, in terms of why it is that materials dissolve. Um, in fact, one of the aspects that is tricky is that we need to think about how the atomic and molecular properties of solvents and molecules relate to macroscopic problems. And the other aspect, which is really very challenging for, for me, is to explain the use of scientific language. I understand many of you may be listening to me in a translation, but translating language and scientific language is really a challenge. And the use of the correct terminology in your own language is very, very important for young people. And some of my students have a really hard time using precise scientific language to refer to elements, atoms, and molecules, for example, in the right, um, with the right terminology. So coming back to the students, it's actually quite easy to understand polarity. Polarity can be taught and it's easy to understand. But it's very difficult and wrong to try to rely on rules about solubility. Which ions are going to dissolve and which are not? It's very, it's tricky to, to use those tables to relate, for example, to the, the solubility of salts in wall paintings. What we know is that sometimes students have very strange ideas about why it is that we have precipitation and why it is we have solubility of a material and not. Um, and oftentimes, the explanations that students have relate more to um, uh, disappearing rather than dissolving, or um, we have other issues with crystallization and dissolution and so on and so forth. But we need to think carefully about how this relates to thermodynamics and how this relates to the molecular forces within our liquid. And this is especially the case, for example, when we think about why it is that we have calcium carbonate dissolving in stone. This is an example of um, a, a very famous set of rock caves where we have the dissolution of calcium carbonate. Why does calcium carbonate dissolve? Well, we understand this if we look a little bit more carefully at the science behind the dissolution of stone. 
And we know that calcium carbonate does dissolve in water. Not very much, but why is this? The reason is that it forms um, the hydrated ion of calcium. And then there's another reaction in the dissolution of calcium carbonate, which is the formation of bicarbonate. In fact, at school, we sometimes learn calculations to do with solubility. But the problem with these calculations is they're very simple. Not, they're not simple to do, but any we can learn to do them. But they don't necessarily help our understanding of solubility when we look at product solubility products and so on and so forth. In fact, scholars have demonstrated that even if we can do the calculations and get the right answer, we might not understand the chemical processes that are going on. And instead, we should focus on looking at what the relationship between solubility and pH is, for example, the particle sizes that we use, the ionic strengths and complexation. And this is something that we are becoming more and more aware of in painting conservation as we use gels with different ionic strengths, with different pHs, with different um, polarities and so on and so forth. And this is sometimes a little bit more straightforward to explain then, for example, mathematical calculations, which are not really useful when it comes to practice. And this, come, this brings me to the question of salt, salts and the problems we have of soluble salts. And the problems we have with soluble salts that you might face in wall paintings and stone and in building materials are huge. I like this picture because it reminds me of the, the vast amount of salt that we have in the salt plains. And we can often find salts on our, the surfaces of our historic buildings and we don't always know what to do. What do we need though to do when we teach about solubility? The first thing I suggest is we make sure we have a good theoretical background. This is my biggest challenge in my, for my students to make sure that when the students arrive, they have some knowledge of thermodynamics, of molecular structure and forces, which you can learn at school or you can learn from a chemistry book or chemistry online courses. But what is it that I can teach which other people cannot teach? Well, we can do laboratories related to conservation problems. And we can also focus on specific case studies, which will help us understand how solubility impacts our daily life. One of the examples is a preparation of pigments, which is very satisfying to do, um, to make pigments and to observe and understand, for example, the preparation of lake pigments. Um, we do this by extracting lake pigments with a solution. We add a uh, solid alum, which changes the pH of our solution. And this causes both bubbling, but also precipitation. And this process is beautiful to watch. My kids love it, um, but so do my students because they are they're able to see and practice the application of knowledge they have from textbooks. And they see it related to something they will work with, which is the colors of the paint. And the other aspect is of course, looking at specific case studies, for example, soluble salts. Why is it we have some salts which cause problems and others don't, and where do they cause problems? And in wall paintings, we know that soluble salts are one of the biggest problems. These are wall paintings that the Courtauld has studied and worked on in Malta, ceiling paintings from the Baroque period. And they were covered when we arrived in very, very disturbing soluble salts. This is perhaps the biggest problem that wall painting conservators around the world face, how to manage these large areas of damage where we know there is salt. And if we look up close, it gets even worse because we have situations where we have crystallizing salts um, which are destroying the paint layer. So what do we do and how do we approach this? Well, one of the issues we have is try to, to try to explain where the salts are and where they are crystallizing. Are they crystallizing on the surface, which is the six, number A? Are they crystallizing in the paint film, which is situation B? Or are they living? in the wall, but not causing problems. These are three different situations which we can encounter depending on the salt and depending on the area and depending also on the concentration of the salt that we have. 
And we know that we have to look ultimately at the question of solubility. Which salts are very soluble? And which salts are doing the most damage? And in fact, the irony of this is that this all relates to theoretical knowledge, which we other which we can we can observe in the field, but we know from theory that the nitrates are very soluble and they are also sometimes the most important. But it's some of the carbonates and the sulfates which are very insoluble, which can cause damage. And instead, the um the uh solvent salts like calcium carbonate and barium carbonate will unlikely cause the damage that we will see with a um, sodium chloride, for example. And we can look at examples from the literature, which, which, which focus on removing salts, for example, from surfaces, from model samples and from real samples. And I am choosing these two examples to show you that indeed it is in studies and conservation that this type of research has been published this is not research which is of interest to other journals necessarily, but it's absolutely essential that we either reference this or use this, but it's also very good to teach from these examples of, for example, removing salts from tiles or removing salts from porous materials so that our students will understand that when we talk about solubility, we're not talking about a concept which has no relation to practice. In fact, it's very related to the practice of, of, of conservation of wall paintings and ceramics. So when we think about solubility, we also try to understand what we want students to learn and where we know that students will have problems understanding. And this is not specific to conservation students. It's, 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 it's related to all students um, because we are, after all, human beings. And our concepts are something that we build up slowly over our lives. But we really shouldn't skip concepts or oversimplify situations. And in fact, maybe my message is that it is okay to accept that things are very complicated and to understand as much as we can, which is in the right stages of our lives. We don't need to be able to calculate with very sophisticated models, but we need to know that these models exist. Uh, we don't need to be able to explain entropy and enthalpy on a daily basis, but we should know that these two concepts exist. Um, we can help our students if we use what is known as interrupted case studies, where we look at articles and texts and see how it is that some that other researchers arrived at their data. Um, and in fact, learning from re published research is very important for my students because I know that in the future, not only will they be producing research, but it is necessary for them to have a critical um, understanding of how research is done and where sometimes research is not really related to their work. And of course, practice is what we need to reinforce theory. We can't learn from books and put the books back on the shelf. Or for me, I try to teach what the students need to learn and need to know when they're doing practical work, because they will then really understand the concepts, for example, of extraction of salts, of identification of salts, but also of, for example, the distinguishing of soluble salts on the surface of an easel painting, for example, and a situation instead where they are faced with insoluble materials, like the presence of oxalates, which you cannot remove. And this comes to the questions also of sustainability and what we face in the real world. Here is an example of an Indian wall painting, which was treated with PVA, a lot of glue in the past. And the glue did not solve the fundamental problem that the painting was facing, which was soluble salts. And we didn't need complex, expensive um, analysis using X-ray diffraction, for example, or using Raman spectroscopy or something like this. Instead, it was possible to identify the salts that were present using simple techniques, simple techniques which I love. For example, using um, ion strips and microscopy to identify the salts which were present on the surface. Why were the salts there? The salts were there because there was an active problem of infiltration of water. And we are also lucky because now we have techniques which are portable. We have techniques which we can take to the paintings. We have tablets that we use and portable microscopes, 
which used to be expensive, but now you can buy them for 20 euros on eBay or on Amazon or in your local shop. And this has really changed the way that we can observe surfaces. And the other aspect of conservation is that we often work in places where we do not have access to expensive materials. We don't want to import um, materials from far away when the paintings that we are working on were made with local materials. So sometimes conservation involves using very locally accessible materials for treatment. And here we have an example of collecting earth for the conservation of wall paintings in Bhutan. And indeed, the preparation of local materials, sand, earth, and stone may sound very straightforward, but this is one of the key aspects of the work that we try to teach, which is that we need to be able to use and understand the materials that were used in the paintings we treat in order to adopt compatible suitable and sustainable materials for their treatment in the future. And here is an example of the treatment of the wall painting in Bhutan, where we can use observation during the injection of a specific grout, which was made not using complicated solvents or adhesives, but instead is based on local, uh, locally available earthen materials and um, and formulas which are carefully studied on site so that the, the, the properties of the grout will satisfy the needs for the specific wall painting. And indeed, we know that preventive conservation, which I mentioned early on, is often the most effective approach. If we can prevent problems, we don't need to treat them. And this is why preventive conservation needs to be a kind of fundamental basis. And I believe that one of the talks in this conference will be about that. The other thing which I am very aware of is that no painting is alike, although we have common problems. We need to often tailor our treatments to specific problems. And too often in conservation, especially in scientific research, we have solutions first before we really understand the problem. We can find many articles which, are fo which focus on a specific product to use or a specific system to use a specific adhesive. And instead we should, instead we know that we are faced with a problem. For example, how do I treat this soluble or this insoluble varnish? Well, I need to figure out what it is first before I try to test everything out because that might really help me in defining my solution. The other aspect is that we need to be able to do work as much as possible in situ without moving our objects or our paintings. It's very complicated when we're talking about wall paintings. And the testing that we do needs to be related to the site and the, and the place where we're working. This can really be helped if we use local materials and techniques. And always keep in mind, of course, that my health and my safety and your health and your safety is paramount. If the building burns down, we are not going to have a conference. If our paintings are um, in a uh, leaky building with rain coming inside, we're going to have much bigger problems than we are if we have um, a, a, a secure roof. But also the use of solvents is changing. As certain materials become less available, we know in the UK and in Europe that some solvents are being removed. And this is going to cause really big problems in the future as we need to find other solutions and other materials for using to, to be able to clean um, paintings where in the past we were able to use solvents, which are now recognized as very dangerous. So on that note, I'm going to stop talking. I hope that I gave you some food for thought and some insights into what we try to do and what I try to do um, at the Courtauld. And I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Austin. Thank you. Ja jums ir varbūt jautājumi šinī mirklī, lai es arī iepriekš teicu, kad mēs uzdosim pēc visām sesijām. Šis nu ir tas mirklis, ka Austinam varbūt tagad ir jāuzdod jautājumu, jo mēs tā kā iziesim no Zooma, bet ja jautājumi nav, tad sakam vēlreiz paldies. Thank you. The question now.